to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Peter McKinley. So uh, let me read a quick bio here. Uh, Dr. Peter McKinley is a research ecologist and plan project manager with the Wilderness Society, uh, based in, out of his office in Hollowell, Maine. Uh, his work includes development of conservation priorities for the National Wilderness Society projects and campaigns with a particular focus on the Northern and Southern Appalachians. Previously, he was with several land trusts as permanent staff or a consultant, uh, forest bird research groups, conservation project director with the Manomet Center for Conservation Scientists in Maine, and a shorebird estuarian conservation with New Hampshire Audubon. He's also worked for with uh, forest certification programs in Maine to direct more attention to biodiversity considerations. Uh, Peter grew up on Cape Cod, uh, we'll forgive him for that, but fell in love with Maine while at Colby College uh, and re returned to Maine as soon as he could after graduating in 1987. Um, he also went to the uh, Indiana University for his master's in ecology, uh, studying wood thrush and forest fragmentation, and the University of New Brunswick for his doctorate in ecology, studying warbler foraging ecology. Peter is the vice president of the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust, Vice President of the High Peaks Alliance, and a board member and land committee chair for the Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. He lives in Damariscotta, where he spends many happy hours paddling and sailing local waters and walking local trails as often as possible. So welcome to Peter, uh, and take it away. Thank you. I'm, I'll, I'll send a quarter of that amount next time. <laughs> That's great. No, we love to hear it. <laughs> I, yeah, and it, so you know, you're all forewarned. I can, I can carry on. Um, so in this this medium, um, I just want to check. Can you can you hear me okay and see my screen okay? Yep, you sound yes. great. We can see you. All righty. And you know what I'm going to do while we're talking? I'm going to. This was on the advice of um, a previous talk I gave. I'm go I I play the bird sounds by um, the very technical method of holding up my, uh, my phone to the... Uh... So was that, was that audible? Did anyone hear a Bicknell's thrush? Yes. That was, yes. Okay. okay, that was pretty quiet, but... Uh... All righty. Well, I'll, I'll I'll give it a try. Yeah, I, I'm. Hi, everybody. I um, thanks for letting me get some of that out of the way. I figured I'd do it now, and I'd then be a little more relaxed and and uh, and take the show away. I um, gave a presentation to fellow staffers at Wilderness Society, and um, our IT person, who's really good, best in the biz, um, advised me not to embed my files, but hold my phone up to my speaker. And I thought, wow, that's about the technological advancement that I would have chosen. So we'll give it a try. Um, but anyway, thank you. I wish we could be together outside on this glorious day. Um, I had the fun of maybe meeting some of you here uh, last year on the Parham Stream Birding Trail. It looks up at Mount Abraham, which is um, what I will be depicting today in a series of photos and, and slides and talk about the birds that we would encounter, might encounter along the way. Um, so I'm going to, again, sorry for this, I'm minimizing, yeah, minimizing the, the tile so you don't um, see, see, uh, see that and lose some of these, these great, great graphics. Um, so as, as an overview, I uh, just thought I'd give you a little roadmap or guide to, uh, to today. Um, I hope that through, through this, um, know or get to know some of the birds in the landscape. We'll uh, touch on representative species across a gradient of elevation. The gradient is just a continuous change of conditions. And um, in this case, elevation um, and soils and, and microclimatic conditions grow everything from black-capped chickadees down lower to boreal chickadees up higher. Um, and the structure of what I'll present will follow several um, stations that were part of a report I did for some high peaks conservation work. High peaks being uh, Mount Abraham um, and uh, Saddleback, Sugarloaf, 
Reddington and the mountains right outside of Rangeley. Um, we borrowed that term from the Adirondacks and my colleagues in Colorado say high peaks and I say well we start at sea level so give us a break. Um, anyway and, and along the way um, in, the, in the vein of getting to know birds we'll talk about their identification representative birds uh, by sight and sound, social interactions such as uh, staking out a territorial claim, their foraging which we uh, just saw a great example of from uh, Doug's little film clip, uh, bre the breeding behavior, habitat, landscape, um, I'll define those as, as the time comes. Landscape is not uh, rhododendrons and the, the edging you do around your perennial garden, but rather the patterns of vegetation and uh, land management um, at typically larger scales. And I'll be talking a little bit about migration because as you'll see, some of the maps show the neotropical migrants and where they, uh, where they spend their winter. And finally, I'll kind of put it all in a context um, that's related to my work, conservation and land protection priorities at multiple scales, including the whole Appalachian Range. So some of these slides here, um, I don't know how well you can read it, but there's the trip, the Mount Abraham Trail. Um, and uh, there's me a few years ago on a Param Stream birding walk, um, pointing to the sky, or I hope a bird, um, Mount Abraham. Actually, I'm pointing toward Mount Abraham in this picture. There's Abraham. It's a rather dramatic change uh, over oh, several thousand feet of elevation from hardwood up to this, uh, up to the little patches of Arctic alpine tundra with Pensia, um, which is an Arctic alpine plant, a lot of rock. And, and in, in the spirit of getting to know birds, um, I, and maybe getting to know me, because if this were a real live bird walk, um, I would enjoy it because it's a chance to be personal and personable. So I, I attempt to pull that off in some of my talks. That book, The Life of Birds, that was from a Cornell Lab of Ornithology correspondence course. Um, of course, now we have the internet, but back when I was 11 years old, 12 years old um, uh, in, in uh, the early, late 70s, yikes. Um, I sent away and, and did a course in birds because I, I wanted to know why the robin was singing. What, what, what makes the robin sing? You know, there's proximate how they do it with their, their syrinx, their voice box, but ultimately why are they doing that? And it turns out to be territory, territory related. Um, there's still a little part of me that holds out that it's for sheer joy. Um, and this other book, Nests, Eggs and Nestlings, I do not advocate collecting eggs or nests, but um, this is a great resource, and these are just examples of the kinds of resources that, um, if you're like me, ride around in a duffel bag in your car or truck. Um, I started out learning birds. There's my original field guide. It's, um, uh, it's in my own personal Smithsonian. Uh, that goes back a while and uh, doesn't leave the house anymore. I love paper field guides, and I got turned on to Peterson a while back, and certainly there are other guides, better guides, but Peterson is my my fave and it might just be out of habit. I learned my birds by song, which is an important thing to do um, or skill to have when you're talking about forest birds um, on cassette tapes and CDs, uh, a little representative picture there. And now of course um, we have apps that take the place of a field guide and an audio guide. And, um, and finally, as I alluded to over to the left here, um, in my, my lower bullet point, conservation and land protection priorities. John Terborg and his associates uh, published this book for popular consumption based on his research and the synthesis of research to date. Um, this came on the scene in, drumroll, 1989, 1990. Um, and the message is the same. Um, here we are, this is a few decades later, and, and um, there are some success stories for birds and conservation, but as you all have seen, no doubt, and are aware, um, bird conservation and conservation of everything um, is, is a serious uh, consideration and, and concern. And it's in the context of climate change, but long before climate change, we were worried about fragmentation and reduction of habitat, overall net loss, subdivision of habitat, and that's where this book uh, spoke a lot about wood thrush declines, 
and um, and other uh, neotropical migratory songbirds declining um, and trying to understand uh, the ro relative roles of the breeding versus the, the uh, wintering grounds. I'll talk about three orders of birds today. This might seem kind of dull, oh, taxonomy. Um, it's, you know, museum stamp collecting, but not really. It's it's the basis for understanding relationships, the evolutionary history, and the ongoing story of birds behaving and using sharp pointy beaks or swimming or flying for their food, being a fly catcher. They go out into the air column and grab some food. Um, a leaf gleaner like a warbler is, is picking from the leaf side, sometimes the underside, sometimes preferentially the, uh, the top sides of leaves. Um, the woodpeckers are, are, are rapping at trees and flicking bark, but of course, in, in the songbirds you see in that red circle, um, there's uh, two different families of birds, the, um, the, 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 you, and you've got the, the nuthatch that specializes on picking at bark, and the woodpecker that picks at bark and then indeed digs in deeper. So it's sometimes informative to understand um, behaviors or how a bird looks in relation to whether they are behaving and looking like a bird because they're related to the bird or because environmental pressures made it that way. And a great example of this, and this continues in the, the vein of getting to know birds and, and how they got to be um, and, uh, and the birds that we'll encounter on this walk of Mount Abraham. Um, on the upper right, you see an imaginary yellow um, ancestor of the oven bird here and the black throated green warbler. Um, and both of these birds are warblers. And here in the lower left um, is the uh, imaginary ancestor of the robin thrush and the wood thrush, a thrush. Um, and as an example of convergent evolution, we have these two different lineages produced convergence in behavior, the oven bird and the wood thrush both um, spend time foraging in the understory and they blend in with the understory, um, yet they come from different lines or different, uh, different heritage. The robin, of course, um, comfortable on suburban lawns, but also comfortable in light gaps in northern forest. Um, and the robin song and wood thrush song sound more similar. Um, sound you can imagine uh, that they, they have a, a common lineage, and the oven bird and the black throated green warbler, they, uh, they, their songs are not so much a warbling, but um, but more a uh, more of a buzzy mechanical. And um, rather than introduce their songs, I'll introduce the oven bird right now. We'll see how well it plays. So that's a mnemonic trick written up there above the oven bird. Teacher, 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 teacher. Some people are gifted and they can remember a sound without needing to file it under some kind of uh, memory trick or mnemonic trick. But the one you'll see written in the field guides for the oven bird, uh, so named the oven bird because it nests on the ground in a dome shaped uh, nest that looks kind of like a Dutch oven, I guess. Uh, not that I've seen a lot of Dutch ovens in my time. But um, that's that's the the source of the name. But again, it's a warbler, and then the, the black-throated green warbler. That was a, a warbler that I uh, studied quite a bit in one of my one of my career chapters, and um, I am going to cue him up. And it's the um, zuzi zuzuzi. So my apologies if that's barely getting through, but um, gave it a shot. Well, that I, sounds fine. Hopefully the kids will. I, um, I, so anyway, that, um, the, the zoo Z, zoo zoo Z um, is actually written in the field guides and, um, and, uh, and it's a trick to help remember the song. Um, 
the Withrush song and the Robin song, I guess because they're more musical, they kind of stand on their own. So we don't have to rely as much on those clever tricks. Just a comparison um, of those two songs, Eole, the wood thrush, does have a mnemonic, but um, it's a made up mnemonic. Um, it's the, that beautiful piping sound. There are not a lot of wood thrush at the, uh, on the flanks and lower slopes of um, Mount Abraham. A little further down in the valley, in the Param Stream Valley, I do hear wood thrush um, in, uh, in the spring. I heard them last spring. And, um, and they, they use mature forest and um, generally bigger blocks of forest. They do better, bigger contiguous blocks. And just for comparison's sake, talking about the convergence and divergence, on the right, we have warblers um, with the oven bird already discussed and the wood thrush. Um, and, uh, and, and looking quite a bit alike um, and uh, showing the convergence on this, this ground foraging strategy in, a, in an effort to blend in. But on to the walk, um, to give you a, an orientation here, this is, um, looking at it now, it's kind of old primitive graphics. I lifted this from a, a study that now feels like a while ago, is 2006, and it's simple and demonstrates the point that we are here in the main high peaks. I'm um, not sure if my cursor is showing. If it's not, um, the high peaks are in the gold square in uh, western Maine, northwestern Maine on the border. Um, and that was the, the focus area, roughly a 200,000 acre uh, focus area for uh, the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust, a project that I did to try to document the resources there in, in the diverse resources there, natural resources, um, uh, animal and plant life. I, um, I don't even want to say, that, use the word resources, I think of timber, timber's there and that's important too, but uh, the biodiversity um, was the, my focus. Um, and here is that gold square and the line, um, I'm tracing it, but, you, but if in case you can't see me tracing it, um, the maroon line that goes from Rangeley over to the left to Saddleback and then down to Phillips, that's one of the transects I did where um, I, uh, I, for this report, took uh, photos and inventories and and so forth to, to document the, the diversity along this, this steep gradient. Not, um, not particularly uh, earth shattering in ecology. Um, the gradients are a, a, uh, a, a, a favorite predictor of biodiversity and determinant of biological diversity um, in all environments, many environments. Here's Mount Abraham. Um, again, I, my cursor may or may not be um, active, but Mount Abraham is the, the area we're gonna walk today, so to speak. Um, just outside of Kingfield, you can pick up a trail, it's that purple thread, and um, I'm going to be showing some representative birds from a, from a walk along that trail. The bird, the bird species are there. I can't claim that I took photos of the bird species on site. However, the vegetation photos, the, the forest photos, are photos taken from on site. And it will include maps of the vegetation present at these various elevational um, breaks or zones. Oh my God, how did that get in there? This is supposed to be a mountain talk. We're sitting in, in uh, at Hendricks Beach in uh, West Booth Bay, uh, a favorite spot of mine to go kayaking. Um, that did, I put that there on purpose, um, actually, as you probably figured. Um, just to demonstrate zonation and, and, and gradients. And there are a couple here, there are probably more than a couple, but um, from, the, from the vantage point of the photographer, me, um, behind me, it turns into marsh grass and um, uh, salt pans and, and then spruce fir forest, um, but, and another gradient left and right, kind of um, transverse across the, the, that little peninsula or spit of land, we've got spruce, and fir trees, um, and then a little bit of uh, Spartina, and then into the rockweed, um, some barnacles, and uh, and water, and um, of course, um, this this is a, a lot of change in a very little period, a uh, very well, very small space, I should say. Um, it takes a little longer and a little more effort walking up a mountain gradient to uh, to get the same levels of change. But the idea is it's, it's the, the soils or, 
or substrates. In the previous photo, sand and mud and uh, water, some of, the, some of that environment is always inundated. Some of that environment is, is inundated twice daily with the tides. Um, and, um, and so uh, organisms living in terrestrial environments strictly, marine environments strictly, and then in the intertidal uh, zones, uh, uh, back and forth kind of between the two. Um, and that's just a way of illustrating what it, it happens in all types of gradients. And here's another one. And, um, and you have to invest a little more time walking in order to see it and experience it. But at the lower elevations, um, this is Mount Abraham. Both photos on the left are Mount Abraham. Um, one is looking up at it from the Appalachian Trail. You can see a white blaze there. Uh, the other is an, an aerial photo uh, looking from into the Parham Stream, Orbiton Stream Valley, where uh, the, some of the projects ongoing or completed um, conservation projects, conservation easements um, have, uh, have taken place. Um, some, of this, some, some of this work I'm, I'm reporting today um, was, has been part of some, some small, hopefully more than small part of the, the ongoing and continuing efforts to conserve this, uh, this landscape. And past, past Abraham, there's uh, Sugarloaf, um, and then the Bigelows and, and a whole pile of other mountains I, I, I could not name. It's kind of like when I go kayak, sea kayaking off the coast, I got my favorite islands. I know people are going to say, what's that? What's that? And, um, and I steer them toward the, towards the ones I know. So, um, so anyway, the, over to the right here, these are a series, the animals um, I cannot lay claim to, um, but the vegetation photos are actually the walk um, a walk of Mount Abraham and starting down low elevation following this physical biological gradient. See a representative, um, a, a warbler that often associated with damp areas, riparian areas, the Canada warbler. Um, Atlantic salmon, decidedly not a fish, not even a flying fish, although they can leap up over um, uh, riffles. Uh, but the salmon breeds up in this this area, and um, and uh, I want, wanted to cover the full taxonomic range, not just uh, keep it to the birds and plants. Um, going up a little bit in elevation, little uh, and and again there there are these there are these there are these patterns of elevation, but layered on top of that, you've got varied soils and forest management histories. So it's not as strict a zonation as we saw on Southport Island. Um, in West Booth Bay, um, but a very general trend, um, moving up slope a little bit into um, uh, some nice, uh, I work in the Appalachians, Southern Appalachians too, and I, would, I was about to say nice cove forest, but um, it's uh, sugar maple, beech, birch, and um, there's a moose, and of course the moose um, is, could be found in most any of these photos, um, but the black-throated blue water, that's, that's about where you'd find him. Um, blackback woodpecker, pine marten is a little mammal in the next photo. Uh, Canada lynx, moving on up into the, the, the transition zone, a little more dramatic, like the, the intertidal zone, as, um, as you break out of tree line on, on a hike of Abraham. The black pole warbler and the Bicknell's thrush. And um, finally up top, uh, not a bird, but rather uh, a picture of that cushiony plant called diapensia, arctic alpine indicator and we do have remnants of um, arctic alpine habitat in these mountains and characteristic i mentioned this earlier in the talk but characteristic of this gradient uh, two good representatives um, black cap chickadee on the left and we see its year-round range um, includes a tiny spine down the appalachians right onto the border of um, tennessee georgia and north carolina up in those high high uh, southern Blue Ridge Mountains, um, and the, the Boreal chickadee over to the right, um, um, and fully aware that, that there's a um, ongoing, or maybe it has been settled. Um, I, think, I, think, I think I've seen Nick's name in the paper about which chickadee ought to be the state bird and on our plate. Um, but anyway, the Boreal chickadee to the right, um, a resident at higher latitudes and higher elevation in Maine, um, I'm keeping an eye on time here, and, and uh, uh, as, I, as I suggested at the beginning with that intro bio, I, 
was reminded that um, I've got to keep an eye on time, but I can't help but take a break here to try out the Boreal Chickadee song. So here we go. Okay, I will not um, uh, uh, subject you to the Black Cap, I, um, a lovely song, but I know you're probably more familiar with that. Uh, but the, um, and, and I don't expect um, any of these birds to now be committed to memory by sight and sound, but rather serve as a, uh, I'm trying to do some comparisons and contrasts to help you, uh, to help you learn. Right? Isn't that what they say about school and reading? You, you might not remember it, but you, learn how to learn, um, at least that's what I hope. Um, and so the, the Boreal Chickadee, um, I think of it, and you think, you know, use whatever tricks you need to use, but it's more of a, um, a nasal, nasally, um, and kind of emphatic, um, uh, chickadee, ding -ing -ing -ing, versus the clipped staccato, chickadee, chickadee, and of course, they are separated along the mountain range by um, elevational zone, but these zones are not like Barnacle versus Spartina back at Southport Island. They're pretty sloppy. And, um, and I've been on walks where I've encountered the Boreal first and gone higher up and there's the black cap. So um, these relations are very general. More typically, however, um, I, I do see them sorting out along elevation. And by the time you're up into trees that are just a little higher than you, um, yeah, you're probably just going to be hearing the boreal, whereas it's the black cap that'll greet you uh, when you pull up and, and park for the, the day's walk. Gradients, gradients everywhere. Another gradient that, that is layered into this, um, this walk up Mount Abraham are, are the, is the gradient of forest age. Now, Forest age may be, uh, may, it may be set back in time to a younger, shorter, smaller, non-woody weed and grassy uh, environment through natural disturbance or through timber harvest. Um, and then all the way on up through the shrub and the young forest community and mature forest community. This is a predictor too of where, of what birds you'll see. So at any given elevation, um, you might, uh, especially lower down in the hardwood and, and mixed wood, um, you might look out and see a black-throated green warbler or a, or a chestnut-sided warbler. Um, and uh, I'll keep it moving for the sake of time and not, not play those two characters. Um, but here's a map on the right from uh, this report I did for the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust. Um, and the anything colored is are those are the forest types the, the greens the yellows the light greens dark greens those are forest types by elevation so it's not that everything in brown topographic lines doesn't have forest it's just that we asked the GIS to just show us the forests less than 1500 feet again thinking of gradients and the and the, the soils and physical conditions um, associated with um, with this walk up the mountain it will be a very rough predictor of dominant vegetation types um, and so it's hardwood beech maple yellow birch um, balsam fir mixed in um, sometimes a, a landscape may be mixed because there's patches of soft and patches of hardwood you might also call it a mixed forest because one tree is softwood one, the next tree is hardwood and uh, living in a hardwood with a softwood component forest would be possibly um, the black-throated blue warbler and the black-throated green warbler. Now the black-throated green warbler is often uh, associated with a heavier softwood component that and but that changes and that that that's that's a, a region there are regional variations. In my work up in New Brunswick they were using almost exclusively uh, pure hardwood stands um, in spite of ample mixed wood and softwood um, uh, nearby. So um, great degree of plasticity in any of these relationships with vegetation, um, successional stage referring to the level of maturity after a disturbance um, or elevation. Um, I, I don't wanna say taken with a grain of salt because at, at a course level, these patterns are there, 
but but rather recognize the patterns are are and can be kind of sloppy. Now the black-throated green warbler and black-throated blue blue warbler are in the same genus Dendroica or Dendroica. Um, um, I think I have. Oh, um, let's see if I can. I, I'll I'll um, skipping that for a minute. I may be wrong, and I might have the wrong uh, the wrong wrong um, uh, label there. But um, moving right along, um, closely related, and the black-throated green warbler. Um, is uh, is the one that goes zoo z zoo zoo z. We already played him, and the black-footed blue warbler. I'll give him a try. Um, let's see here. Okay. Well, that's the black-throated blue warbler. Um, we're in a hardwood forest at about 1,500 feet, hardwood mixed wood. And um, the black-throated green warbler, um, right here, you heard him before, but I'll, I'll play him again. Okay, no way that um, these will be committed to memory by the time we're done, but um, but but the guide or the take home is um, here's where the mnemon the mnemonic the memory trick seems to really help um, the the phrase saying zoo z zoo zoo z or zoo zoo z zoo z is the the buzzy black throated green and the um, zer 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 or zer 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 um, uh, the, the, that mnemonic is meant to capture the, the syllables and, and the accents is the black-throated blue warbler. Um, and I've also included here their maps, thinking about the, the, the uh, conservation and, and habitat they use, um, both using the northeastern um, uh, subboreal, northern hardwood transitional forest and occurring breeding um, in the case of the black-throated blue, it's um, the summer breeding is in kind of a brick color, and you can see it following the Appalachian spine down into the southern Blue Ridge. Same with a black-throated green warbler. Um, but as as you can also imagine, conservation becomes um, is very challenging and a, a more complicated story because these are neotropical migrants, one of several dozens of species, two of several dozens of species wintering in the Caribbean and Central America and Northern South America. Um, and, uh, and there's often a, a, a fidelity or a, a, a linkage between a, nor a population of say, Maine black-throated green warblers, um, uh, a winter in a different part of the Caribbean than a population of Michigan black-throated green warblers. So um, it's complicated teasing apart the source of declines and, and doing conservation internationally. Here, here again is the, those range maps. As a boy looking in that crusty old field guide, um, uh, 11 years old, I didn't, hadn't been to the Smokies yet. <clears throat> and, but I imagined, I said to myself, well, that frying pan handle, excuse me, I call it the frying pan handle the range of the bird going down into the southern Appalachians. I figured that there must be something comparable to that part of the world, um, uh, comparable to my part of the world um, growing up in, in New England and uh, later, later settling in Maine. Um, but as noted earlier, starting on Cape Cod, which by the way, did not have black-throated blue warblers nor black-throated greens. Um, and um, in, in, by way of identifying and be, be becoming familiar, whether you're using an app or your field guide, um, the black-throated green or black-throated blue warbler, uh, the white wing bar on the female is a, is a good giveaway. Um, sometimes quickly on a bike ride out there at Southport Island where, where, I, where I bike in the evenings, um, a junco will flit across and I'll 
say, oh, it's a black throated blue. No, it's just a junco. So some of some of birding is learning learning the birds, whether it's songs or visuals that you may confuse uh, may confuse with each other, um, and and then picking up on that quick diagnostic that um, tells you it's not the other bird. Another part of the field guide, this is the anatomy of your resources. Um, again, whether it's your app or your field guide, um, there's a lot of information packed in here. Um, it's tempting to flip through the book and, and, and say, oh, it's got that patch or it doesn't have that patch. That's important. Um, um, also noting here another, another point to bring forth, uh, male and female variation, sexual dimorphism is the, the $10 term. Um, oftentimes the male in songbirds and other birds is a little more showy. Um, song is of course, song and visual display are related to uh, maintaining um, a territory. Um, this song and display is, is with respect to other males that might want to include his polygon or piece of space uh, to overlap with the other individuals. Also, it's to attract females. Um, and some say it's the female is doing the sizing up of the territory and not really sizing up the male, the, but the male is procuring and maintaining a, a good territory and all that advertising and showmanship is, is uh, directed and performed with regard to the other males. Um, and so it's an, indirect, uh, it's an indirect effect on the female. He procures this territory. Um, certainly it, it's probably a bit of both. Um, I noted earlier the black-throated green using conifers. Here are the habitat um, for the entry in this Peterson Field Guide that I took a photo of on my desk. Um, habitat mainly conifers. Well, um, I don't be afraid to see anomaly and variation or something different from what your field guide says. Um, it's sometimes circular. If something says such and such an animal does not occur here, such and such an animal does, is not found in this tree, well, if it's actually occurring there or in that tree, um, if, you take, if you take the guide uh, at its word, you'll never make a new discovery. So don't be afraid to learn, um, but also don't, please don't get the impression that, that these gui guides are wantonly wrong. But you know, again, the theme here, I think one of them emerging is there's pattern, we try to organize the world, but uh, there's, there's some slop and, 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 and some gradients. There's that word again. Um, and again, the voice, a lisping, dreamy. Um, yeah, I guess it's dreamy. Zoo, zee, zoo, zoo, zee, or zee, 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 zoo, zee. Uh, those two songs, incidentally, are done in two different contexts. I will not get into them there, but, but follow up on that if, you, if you're on the edge of your seat, because one is done um, more for mate attraction in the presence of a female, and one is done um, more for territorial delineation in the presence of another male. All right, I'll give it away. The one, the one that is done for the other male with respect to is the one we think that is harder to pinpoint in space. Um, so he's saying, I'm here, this is mine, um, but he's doing his best not to be found because um, a physical contest usually doesn't do anyone any good. Um, so any, anyhow, um, the mnemonic tricks, uh, songs and calls, territory, mate attraction, um, uh, keeping in touch with the fledglings, and contact on migration. Uh, speaking of migration, I've been showing you some neotropical migrants. Um, these birds in, wintering in the Caribbean, Central America, Northern South America, uh, coming to North America to take advantage of the shopping carts full of insects, um, so to speak. Uh, for the brief time period, it seems brief these days, um, that we have leaves here in Maine, and then we have insects living on the leaves. And, um, and then these insects are great sources of protein for building eggs and muscle and sinew in young, in young nestlings and fledglings. Um, and for that matter, uh, keeping the heart and soul of the adults alive too. And of course, a berry and vegetation crop or uh, fattening up pre-migration before, oh, September, October, when we uh, return to our 10 or 12 or 15 resident species. The hermit thrush is a partial migrant. 
Um, you could say the robin is a partial migrant too. I, I think the robins I'm probably seeing on my trees in my backyard in January are probably robins that may have shifted from uh, northern Maine or, or even, even further north into the maritime provinces. And my summer robins, so to speak, um, have made their way possibly toward, uh, toward Cape Cod. The hermit thrush you see here breeding throughout New England, um, western states, western mountain states, all across Canada, um, and the Adirondacks, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, um, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and, uh, and uh, Nova Scotia as well, uh, and wintering in the blue zone um, from mid-Atlantic down. Um, and I remember when, when I worked at Manomet, we uh, did, did our field work in the summers um, based out of Moosehead area, and, um, and in the wintertime lived in a dormitory on Cape Cod Bay, Manomet being in, um, in the town of Plymouth. And um, we used to have, um, and sure enough, it's right at the, in this map anyway, right at that, that edge, used to have a wintering hermit thrush um, hanging around us on uh, Cape Cod Bay, um, but not singing. And still, we're still um, in this hardwood zone, still in this hardwood mix zone at about 1,500 feet to uh, 1,800 on Mount Abraham. Yellow-bellied sapsucker, a migratory woodpecker, versus the blackback, downy, hairy, and pileated. Um, here on the right, you can see uh, it's wintering versus its uh, summering range. Um, and the yellow-bellied sapsucker, I'll, uh, I'll give, a, give him a try. Um, Bear with me a sec. Giving him a try with the uh, the uh, song. So if that came through, the, um, the the key point there is you've got woodpeckers. They peck. Well, they peck to make a nesting cavity, but you're probably not hearing them making their nesting cavity because the nesting cavity is in a slightly softer tree, a little easier to excavate that cavity. Um, what, what that drumming was, that tapping, that was, that was for, and that, that tapping, nor was that tapping foraging because um, they are also pecking in order to get a meal. Um, but that pecking was communication. That was a drumming. Um, and it's a tap, 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 tap. On, on a nice sounding board. I think there's probably some forethought or selection that goes into um, on those trees that they advertise or use to advertise. Um, also in another couple weeks, the it's always amazed me how loud the young are, the sounds of the begging young in the nesting cavities of yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Um, the evolutionary biologist in me sometimes wonders, wow, how could how how could it be a payoff to be that loud uh, to predators? But um, I, maybe the payoff is the, that, that, that this species of parent really needs a reminder that we're hungry and we're right here. Um, but I, I'm sure some of you have uh, have been aware or or please track it down because it's one of the easier woodpecker nesting cavities to find because the young just sit in there announcing themselves. So we're still low down on the mountain. Um, downy and hairy woodpecker. Um, there are there are species specific tapping and whinnying sounds I won't go into as I glance at my watch here. Um, but uh, but the downy and, and hairy are um, probably very familiar from your feeders. But they're also forest birds, kind of like the robin. Um, the robin's a thrush that um, cosmopolitan does well a lot of places. But um, but they're forest birds too. The robin, of course, using open patches, but I've seen them um, nesting like a woodland bird up in the Allagash. Um, so uh, the, um, the, the point here, I think one take home before I move on, um, people say, well, how do we tell them apart? And then someone might say, well, the hairy's bigger um, than the downy. Well, that doesn't work all that well if they're not next to each other. Um, and so here, look at the beaks. Um, the beak of each bird, hairy on the right, um, in relation to the, uh, the length of their head. When I say the length of their head, uh, picking a line from the base of the beak to the back of the head. Um, the, the hairies is 
pretty close to the length of the head. Um, and the downies is, oh, I don't know, half. So, um, and, and, and then you see them together and one is obviously bigger, but it's not always so obvious if they're apart. So we moved up the elevational gradient just a tad. Um, this map taken from that report, um, um, I might have misspoken a little while ago, we were up to about 1500 feet. Um, here we are at 15 to 2500 feet. These are the forests that occur in that elevation zone. So you can almost see how from Phillips, Avon and Strong, that's where the forests were lit up in the previous map at lower elevation. Um, and, uh, and now we're, we've gone up the gradient and it, what, it, what it shows us is that the towns of Rangeley and, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and surrounding areas are at a higher elevation than Madrid and Phillips and Salem. And this is a photo taken um, from uh, another uh, thousand feet up, up the uh, trail and um, softwood with some hardwood mixed in, fir, spruce, and birch. And um, one of the birds occurring here might be the Blackburnian warbler. Now I'm not trying to say or imply that the Blackburnian only occurs above elevation X or Y or Z, but on this particular walk, on this particular gradient and forest composition, when softwood component starts coming in, um, the Blackburnian is keying off that softwood component, often singing from and nesting in a softwood tree with some hardwoods around it, just to set the record straight here by the shores of the Damariscotta River in the Dodge Reserve, um, uh, one of the, or the first parcel conserved by the uh, Damariscotta River Association in the early 70s, there are breeding Blackburnian warblers um, 20 feet off of sea level, but they're keying in on the softwood. And so this, this talk of a gradient um, and elevation, it's, it's the softwood that is, uh, is coming in because of the elevation on Mount Abraham that then might predict that we hear a Blackburnian warbler. I, um, I'm going to keep moving on so so we get through the uh, the walk, the tour, so to speak. Um, and um, I'm not sure how the audio is working anyway. Um, a couple more permanent residents, not migrants, spruce grouse um, occurring at northern latitudes or high up on the mountain. Um, and the blackback woodpecker, Doug, uh, was on the lookout for the blackback. Um, his, his walk and uh, recent talk here. Um, I, uh, what do I, I haven't seen too many in my life, have seen them, seen them maybe seen and heard um, half a dozen, dozen times on um, Big Moose Mountain in uh, Moosehead Lake area. I think it's, that's the name. Yes, Big Moose Mountain, um, the ski area. And, um, and at lower elevations in Softwood, um, up around Lily Bay, so again, it's not strictly the elevation. It's not that, oh, I'm at 2,000 feet. Now it's time for blackbacks. It's more that on this particular walk and many walks in uh, the mountains of Maine, uh, there's a rough correlate between the elevation you find yourself at and the tree types, the softwood versus hardwood or mixed wood. Um, and then in, in an added component, I talked a little bit about gradients of forest age and structure and type. Um, after a burn or insect kill, um, you'll, you'll often find the blackback woodpecker uh, uh, tapping away and flaking the bark away, big, big peels of bark, well not peeled all at once, but the net result is big areas of exposed bark um, and very, very neat, tight circular hole. It's almost like they, they have a compass. They pull out not a navigational compass, but a drafter's compass because um, it's a very, very neatly chiseled hole, the few I've seen. So these are two other birds that you might encounter, the spruce grouse. If you do encounter the spruce grouse, probably they're pretty tame, um, or at least not in a rush to get away. Um, uh, um, kind of in contrast to the rough grouse, which probably more likely seen and heard uh, lower down the mountain in the hardwood. Finally, um, subalpine, Krumholtz alpine, um, I'm not depicting any, um, any, any, uh, any birds here. Um, well, I am in a moment. The um, black pole and the um, uh, Bicknell's thrush. Now, the Bicknell's thrush and black pole are not on the diapensia cushion 
or, uh, or using these rocks, but they are using the high elevation forests, subalpine forest, the upper right photo, um, upper left photo. These are where I broke out on above tree line on that report study I did a while back and, um, and, and documented the black pole and the, um, the uh, Big Nels thrush there. And there are many surveys since throughout those mountains, uh, uh, sketching out the population um, of, the, uh, of the Big Nels thrush. And these two maps are showing um, two different elevational zones. The lower map is all forest. And, and in the key, you can see dark green is coniferous. We've gone into mostly coniferous by now. Um, that's coniferous, not carnivorous. Um, and, uh, and then even higher up, greater than 3,500 feet, uh, little patches of the Arctic alpine. Um, and that's the diapensia plant, the flowering white plant in the lower right. Um, but uh, I gave it away, but here we are, the, the uh, either high latitude or high up the mountain gradient um, into this vegetation zone. Uh, we've got the black pole warbler on the right and um, the big nose thrush on the left. I, um, oh, I have all kinds of lovely songs I'd like to play and compare the Viri to the Bicknells to the Swainson's Thrush, but um, I, um, I think I, bet, I best hold off um, and, uh, and just say that the, um, well, I can't resist one story. On the Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust inaugural bird festival walk last year, one of them, I was with several people who agreed to go on a little logging road drive later in the day after we walked the, the hardwood bottomlands and mixed wood of Parham Stream, we uh, took some logging roads up into a spruce fir zone, cheated by uh, internal combustion, and um, to an area that I knew every year, reliably, black pole warblers. And we got there and I'm listening and listening and listening and not hearing any. And then a couple of the people with me start saying, oh yeah, there they are. There they are, and then I was like, "No, no, real, no! I know the black pole. I'd be hearing it." And and the woman there, maybe she's out there in the audience today. Um, she was hearing it just fine, and I had, at the age then of 54, finally crossed the threshold. All my mentors told me would happen one day. I had lost the frequency of the black pole warbler, and I was able to train my binoculars on the black pole see its beak moving, see it moving its head side to side and dead silent. So um, appreciate these high frequency birds while you can and um, take people along with you who are younger. Um, and so finally, I'm going to wrap up here with a little bit of the conservation context. I'm from the Wilderness Society. Um, I work a lot with uh, diverse partners and get behind and help write working forest easements that include um, that include timber management, motorized, and all manner of recreation. Um, we try to find we try to find areas where there are ecological reserves set aside that um, are not managed for timber, but um, there are large areas that are, and and I'm glad they are managed for wood products. Um, we we try to write easements that do it. Uh, in a way that maintains forest structure, age, and composition. Um, sometimes we hit the mark, sometimes we don't. Um, but the landscape has a lot of demands, a lot of interests, a lot of people who, um, who intersect on a lot more than is commonly first assumed. Um, and so whether you're hunting or, or driving something that takes petrol or, um, or propelling yourself, whether you're bird watching or hunting, um, I don't know what the overlap is, but it's a pretty big overlap. You know, this, the overlap being the, the values, the interests. We all want forest, or um, many of the people I speak of. This is a picture. The backdrop picture is Reddington Mountain, um, about a 10,000 acre easement uh, that I helped write along with um, uh, Simon Rucker and Trust for Public Land. And the Navy, uh, ask me another time how the Navy became involved, but um, it's a, an easement with public access and um, ecological reserve now held by um, Northeast Wilderness Trust and uh, working forest held by the owner um, uh, who lives across the Atlantic somewhere. Um, 
conservation, some of the some of the finer scale things we're worried about. There's landscape level. Um, my own work with the black-throated uh, green warbler. I was I was looking at their tree species selection and use, and and the arthropods yielded by particular tree species, and their foraging efficiency in particular tree species. And so it's pretty easy to imagine that the beach is selected well out of proportion to its abundance. The American beach is A M B E in the lower left graph or uh, or plot. Um, if a if if a landowner or manager doesn't like beach because it doesn't make um, good income, then when you're writing an easement, you want to be pretty careful that you you provide for the diversity of tree species because it turns out the American beach um, is pretty important, and we linked it to actual reproductive success of black-throated green and black-throated blue warbler populations. Um, the wood thrush, going back to pre work way back um, for me in the late '80s. Um, we're looking at interior fragmented habitat, interior habitat versus fragmented habitat and their reproductive success. And these are concerns and considerations for landscape planning. Um, and finally, uh, some of my work, I wanted to put it in a, in a bigger context, is we're looking at the Appalachian Trail, which is protected to at least 1,000 feet, goes through many national parks and national forests. And in Maine, it goes through a lot of private landscape. Um, where the, the Appalachian Trail is a good start on what may very well be an important um, climate adaptation corridor or series of reserves in the context of climate change. And even without climate change, long before climate change was a concern from a conservation point of view, we were worried about fragmentation and, and habitat reduction overall. So um, the Appalachian Trail is a, a 200,000 acre, 2,000 mile national park. And, um, and so I spent a bit of my time working in the Southern Appalachians and the Northern Appalachians. Um, here's a map of some of these landscape considerations. The high peaks is in there in the lower uh, left of the state of Maine and these maroon blobs are, are unroded big contiguous blocks. And I'm gonna stop there because there is not an ounce of time left to um, have some fun comparing. And Peter, that was fantastic. Thank you. We, we are pushing time and I want to, uh, first of all, thank you so much for that great presentation. And then I want to make sure we can get a few questions in. Um, and yep. I also want to ask you if you could unshare your screen so I can try to set up for the next uh, yeah, loon, absolutely. The loon, virtual loon cruise starting in just a minute. Yeah. That'd be great. So, sorry about going over. No problem at all. Uh, so first question um, from Nancy. Um, quickly, Peter, can you tell us about songbirds, uh, including the red-bellied woodpecker, that are dramatically changing their territories as the climate warms? Oh yeah, that's that's really a cool question, Mike. So my folks, it, we live here. Uh, they live nearby in Bristol, Maine, and um, they were hearing this, seeing this woodpecker that they'd never seen before. It was a red-bellied, um, and I've been I, as a boy on Cape Cod. It was a novelty to have it on Cape Cod. And and it, and it, it was it, with changing climate. Um, we believe, and I think the evidence is pretty strong that um, it is expanding its range northward. The cardinal is another one. Um, Amy Meehan, I worked with, um, and John Hagen worked with them on the Manomet project in the early '90s, late '80s, and um, she was from Windham, Maine, and it was a big deal for her to see cardinals in Windham, Maine, growing up as a as a girl and as a child, and um, and and now um, they're all over the mid coast and um, and the, and so the red belly too. Our local paper, the Lincoln County News local broadsheet uh, here in in the Bristol Peninsula near Pemaquid, um, had an article about an explosion this year. Uh, that's kind of a dramatic term, but um, a, a lot of red bellies in the area. Um, so yes, a quick version is we are seeing a range expansion. It is most likely. Um, more than likely uh, climate change related. Um, and, um, and so um, it, it's an example of the, the need to maintain these stepping stones of habitat um, uh, you know, roughly along a north-south corridor. Great, thank you. Um, I, I will ask one more question. Um, I know we're pushing time, but have you seen Bicknells at a lower elevation during the breeding season? I believe yeah. I heard one, and this is from uh, C, uh, parish. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. That, that, um, this, uh, well, backing up a sec, I have, and that's why I was, I was thinking of that very topic 
when I was saying, look, I'm talking about elevation and habitat type, but it's, it's sometimes it's, it's really the habitat type that's often associated with elevation. Great example, up in New Brunswick, um, when I was doing some, some of my graduate work, um, um, I was in the same camp as a woman working on Bicknell's thrush that were breeding in low ele lower, low elevation, much lower elevation, not even on a mountain, um, um, early regenerating areas um, after harvests on, uh, turned out it was Irving property. Um, so yes, in, in, a, in, a, in a quickly, yes, low, lower elevation, but keying in on the vegetation structure. Great. Peter, thank you so much for joining. That was a fantastic presentation, very informative, uh, and we, uh, and thank you very much.